Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. I'm Roman here, here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and author interviews. This week is episode number 264 of the show, and I got five new reviews for you folks. That's going to include Shadow Sun Unification, uh, Lotus Lake, Underground, uh, Dungeon Walkers, Book One, and Face Genius, which is going to be our uh, webcomic of the week. Um... But before we go into any of that, of course, we're going to jump right into Lit RPG News. Uh, we just got one quick bit of Lit RPG News this week. Uh, Dakota Kraut, um, author of many great Lit RPG stories, Dungeon, um, Divine Dungeon series, Completionist Chronicles. Uh, he's also the uh, head of the Mountaindale Press. Uh, him and his wife. Um... Dakota Kraut got an exclusive interview with Business Insider. Um, I couldn't read it because I'm not a subscriber, but uh, the head title is um, author goes from um, hobby novelist to um, claiming $1.8 million a year in five years or something like that. Um, so it's definitely a positive interview. Um, Dakota has always been really free about how he has built his success and is always happy to share those with people, whether it's in the new article like that, or just on their Discord server or on the Mountain Dale Press uh, Facebook page, where he does a very frequent QA. So it's always interesting to see other people recognize, you know, somebody now, somebody we know uh, from, from the genre. Um, Dakota Crowd also did an interview with um, Authors in Dragons Podcast, which is a kind of DD um, podcast where we're uh, several authors who are friends and, and they, they do promotion for them and stuff, but they also played a, a a game, uh, a tabletop uh, D&D, essentially. Uh, and including on that particular podcast is Robert Bevan, Drew Hayes, two authors who are um, who write in our genre, or at least tangentially, maybe in Gamelet, um, but also a bunch of other good authors who I've always really enjoyed. I'm, I'm a big fan of the podcast. I always think it's very funny, entertaining, lots of cursing, lots of <laughs> inappropriate jokes. If you've ever read Robert Bevan's stuff, the Caverns and Creatures stuff, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but it was fun to see Dakota Kraut go on there and kind of get a little inappropriate, uh, but just like very, you know, safely. <laughs> so, and to see him talk about uh, his writing, his publishing, um, what he does for these authors and, 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 and a group of like authors who do pretty well in their own rights, just kind of being impressed uh, with Dakota. So we have links in the show notes for those two articles, for the article and for the podcast. Uh, there's a YouTube version of it. You can pick up for free or you can you know, subscribe to their podcast to, to listen to it, but it's definitely fun and interesting. So, uh, congratulations to Dakota. And it's always fun to hear, uh, him do stuff. Okay. On to stuff that is out now. Haven't, uh, why well, I've had a chance to read some of these and I forgot to take them off. Um, that's going to be Lotus Lake, uh, rise of the magic mystic mediation, which we're actually reviewing on the podcast this week. Also out this week though, or this, uh, since the last podcast is clan dominance, the sleepless ones book number six, which is, um, the latest book in the world, the uh, World of Eldera series. That's what it was formerly titled. Um, and if you're a fan of this series, this is the first book that's come out that's newly translated, newly published. That whole series got us had translation issues. That was a big thing for it. Um, but I also had a bunch of fans, and so the publish the author uh, hooked up with the new publisher. Uh, Magic Dome Books, and they've done this whole relaunching thing of it, including a new cover art, um, a different series name, um, and they're they're continuing to publish a very long-running series, and this is the newest book in the series that's never been published in the U.S. before, so if you're a fan of that series, if you're a fan of the Rule of the Valdira series, it's now called um, Clan Dominant Series, uh, so FYI, and, and book six is out if you're in, in that series. Um, also out, though, is Singularity Online book number four, also the Rogue Merchant book number five, also the Good Guys book number 11, and uh, Circe's Horizon book number two is out as well, as is a new book from Jez Kayo, uh, Age of Stones, which is a Dungeon Core novel currently from him. Um, also out is the third book in the Guild Core series, and the Towers of Heaven's book number three is out as well, um, also Derelict book number three, and uh, this book called Forge of the Eternity, Alpha Testing. And the second book in the Overtaken Online series is out as well. Uh, a short novella, less than 100 pages, is out from the uh, Game of God series called a 3.5 book, which is just, uh, I guess, a tower novella in between the books. 
Um, the System Multiverse, book number three, is out. And Chrono Templar, Quincy Liberty Story from... Um, there you go. That's all the stuff that's out that I know about. Uh, in new audiobooks, we've got a couple great titles, including The Wandering In, book number three. Um, I think it's coming out like 20, uh, 37, 38 hours. Um, you cannot get this as an ebook currently, which is surprising. You can only get it as an audiobook right now which is extra surprising. I'm like, wait a second. Uh, or maybe I'm, I'm, I might, I might be wrong. Um, but it's entertaining. It's there um, for you to go check out. Um, also out is Blast Off, a fun science fiction liberty adventure. Also the third book in the Enderverse series is out as an audiobook. The third book in the Eternal Online series is out as an audiobook. Concordant Online is out. Um, a new book from... Um, some authors in the Nora series, um, the Fireborn book number one as an audiobook. Also out is Real Time Strategy, com- Real Time Star Commander book number two, Grand Assault um, book number two in that series is out as an audiobook. Rise of the Resurgence book number two, also Tower Climber book number two is out as well as is uh, Dungeon Crawler Carl book number two, and the entire Glendaria Awakens trilogy, which is a Dungeon Crawler story from Jonathan Brooks, out as one. Uh, release volume. So if you've if you've never read them, this is a good shot to to make your uh, audible credit tr- stretch. Um, also out is Asgard's Fall, Digital Rebirth Chronicles, and the second book in the League of Losers series is out as well as is the Rogue Dungeon book number five. A bunch of cool things out as audiobooks for those you who enjoy, who enjoy listening to your audiobooks. Okay, and stuff that's coming out in the near future. We have an upcoming Liturgy. G. This again. Just me reading up more stuff with dates or release dates, but this allows readers to plan their their purchasing schedule. Also, um, if you're an author in the genre, this helps you to plan your publishing schedule. You don't necessarily want to uh, publish when there's like 17 other books coming out that day. Um, you might want to move it around if that's possible. And this is a nice little list that may help you to do that. Um, starting with May the 1st. Uh, tomorrow, it's going to be Awaken Online Hellion. May the 3rd, and NPC Spath, book number 4. May the 4th, Towers and Rifts, book number 2. May the 4th is going to be Jeff the Game Master, book number 1. May the 4th, the second book um, from M.A. Carlson's Superhero Liberty series called Planet Hero Sidekick is going to be out. May the 7th, it'll be another online clockwork, which is the second book in the series. Uh, May the 7th, a new book from Ryan DeBurn is going to be Star Tower, System Misinterpret, book number one, a post-apocalyptic cultivation liturgy. Mouthful title. Um, so that'll be out. On May the 10th, it'll be The Guns and Kaldora, book number four. Uh, May the 10th, it'll be Product Stellar, book number four. May the 10th, Ether Frontier. On May the 11th, Beta Tester, book number six. May the 11th, it'll be Magnus, book number one. May the 12th, the second book um, from David Petrie, Necrotic Apocalypse, book number two. May the 12th, it'll be Underdog, book number six. May the 13th, The Alchemist, book number five. May the 14th, it'll be Real, um, The Great Centurion, Punic Wars, book number three. May the 14th, Range, book number two. May the 18th, the second book in the He Who Finds a Monster series. May the 18th, Discardian, book number seven. May the 19th, Arcana Unlocked, book number two. May 24th, it'll be The Prince of Power, a Ludwig Cultivation Saga. May 25th, it'll be Hexworld, um, which is a <laughs> a more game literature, apparently, story. Uh, a re, uh, novel that was published previously and is being revamped, um, hopefully more game literature. Uh, than it came out previously, but it's being published by Kevin J. Anderson, who's super famous um, in a, many genres of writing. So, uh, On May 27th, it'll be the third book in the Pocket Cosmos series. May 28th, it'll be a daring plan in a cold summer, which is the Bone Knight book number five. May 31st, Dungeon Slayers book number three. June 1st, VR Hero book number two. June 1st, The Warlock Chronicles book number three. June 1st, it'll be Beastborn book number three. On June the 4th, it'll be The Rogue Merchant, book number 6. June 7th, the first book from um, new, new writer Simon Bale, who also runs the Facebook page for Mount Magic on Books. So a lot of people are familiar with this. His face and his, his tag on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, he runs like their English division. Uh, but he is... Um, or even social media division, I should say. He's actually wrote a book, and it's out on June the 7th, called Second Shot, Fantasia book number one. Um, June 8th, it'll be Defiance of the Fall. Uh, June 22nd, 
Timurian Online, new story, of course. Um, June 29th, it'll be Primacy Online, book number six. June 30th, Pandemonium, book number two. June 30th, it'll be The Good Guys, book number 12. Uh, July 1st, it'll be Evil Born, book number four. Uh, July 1st as well, it'll be Dungeon Crawler, book number four. So we just recently got book number three. Book number four will be out on July 1st again. July 2nd, it'll be The Sleepless Ones, book number seven. So Clan Dominance, the same series we talked about previously. Um, July 12th, it'll be The Dinosaur Dungeon, book number two. On July 13th, World of Magic, book number one. Uh, July 20th, that second book in that same series from uh, Kevin Janderson called Hex World 2. Uh, July 20th, They Call Me Matter. On July 27th, Fast Frost World. July 27th, Play Reboot is adopt book number six. So all kinds of stuff coming out in the near future for you to enjoy on to new releases and reviews. Okay, first up this week for review is going to be Shadow Sun Unification Book Shadow Sun Book Five in that series written by Dave Wilmarth. It is 347 pages. It is four dollars ninety nine cents. It's available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. Alistair just wants to restore the human race. He's doing his best with the resources he's gathered to locate other survivors around the world and unite them. His intentions are good and he pushes hard. The Drac eggs hatching are hatching, and his people have dreams of both a murdered chicken cavalry and a Drake mounted air force. A small army of class trainers are helping to make his citizens stronger than ever, better able to survive the hazards of their new reality. But fate and the aliens who keep throwing stronger and more deadly challenges at them are working against Alistair. The threat of vengeance from the Formorian matron, the machinations of Loki in hell, and the jealousy of a fellow human with a lesser noble title all add to the pressure. When seeming good fortune turns to tragic loss, Alistair must push through and remain strong in order to face the very beings responsible for the apocalypse on Earth, the murderers of humanity. And this confrontation, even victory, has dire consequences. Okay, uh, full disclosure, I'll be seeing events copy for you, and purchase a copy when it became available. Um, this is a very easy review. I'm a huge fan of the series. Um, it's, it's always entertaining, and this is no different. Um, the scope of the story is getting bigger and bigger with every single entry. entry. I'm not really sure where it's going to be going in the future, to be honest. But at this point, um, the, the scope is essentially encompassing most of the Earth. Um, and so, like, one way I can see it, Going is like, oh, now they're going to go to outer space, I guess? Or like larger spaceship battles, maybe? I don't know. It, I'm curious to see where it goes. But in this particular uh, entry, book number five, um, you're getting a main character who's becoming super powerful. His faction is taking over most of the world. Um, and that brings a, a new scope of, of trouble for him. Um no longer is the story just concerned with like a small villain who's who's threatening his small group or just a particular city. Now he has threats to multiple cities still at the same time. He has like these bigger antagonists that th that try to threaten the entire Earth system or his. Um, in this case, you can see the space station there. Um, and so you're going to just get these like larger scale battles, and and it's good and bad in that it's good that there's a variety, and it's bad in that. I think it's more challenging to write a uh, to scale up these villains in, in line with you know the power creep that's happening with the main characters. Um, but still, all the stuff you if you enjoy the series, you're going to still get the good action adventure. Um, you're going to get the good um, character development, RPG development. All the way, and even that is a little muted in because the characters are getting so powerful and they're getting so many levels at one time. Um, you're not getting a ton of necessarily RPG, you know, leveling or, or progression. I'd say like deciding new powers, whatever the case is, there is some of that still. Um, but it is very specific to the group of enemies that appears in this novel, which I'm not going to spoil. Um, so again, the story has several good antagonists, which are talked about in the novel description. And it's, I think it sets up a new mysterious one for for future books potentially um but i genuinely like how uh, how the author does not give any uh cares about who he's killing off in this story like he, he's 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 very okay with killing off like main group characters um and and major villains finally and i'm, I'm super happy to see like some like series villain just like okay you finally got your comeuppance and i was like oh, okay that's that's pretty nice 
Um, and like the, the reasonable consequences of those, of those, of those endings and those, those, those deaths potentially. Um, so the, like, like a good RPG apocalypse story should, you should have character deaths because it's the apocalypse. Um, and that, that happens. So all the good stuff here, um, action, adventure, territory expansion, all that good stuff still exists. And I had a good time with that. Um, shadow sun unification gets a score of 7.8 out of 10 for me. Almost great. Um, just like really, really good though for me. So all kinds of great stuff. And it was an easy, super easy read because it was so exciting. There's so much action. There's so much adventure that and the pacing is done very nicely, even though it is over almost 350 pages, it, it, it kind of burns through. So that's a really great score for me. That's Shadow Sun Unification, book number five with a score of 7.8 out of 10. Really good time with this. Next up is going to be Lotus Lake, Rise of the Mystic Mage, written by Jay Boyce. It is 393 pages, $3.99. It's available on Kindle Limited, and here's the author's description. Reborn five years in the past, a second chance to do everything over? What would you do? For Ashlyn, being reborn five years in the past is both a boon and a bane. She's reborn in the wreckage of tragedy, forced to deal with a life that she messed up before. Now she has to show for her life as five years of accumulated knowledge of the greatest virtual reality game ever released, Elysium, and the pain of friendships lost. This time, Ashlyn is going to make a difference. This time, she's going to fix the mistakes she has made and save the relationships she has lost. And to do that, she's going to use all the knowledge she gained from the future of Blaze for the from the future to blaze her way to the top in a new class, the Mystic Mage. Okay. Um, this is a slice of life story where the main character goes back five years in time to relive her life just as the VR game she had dedicated herself to um is 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 coming out for the first time. Um she's gonna use all the secrets she's learned of the game um to to kind of get a head start and to advance her character in that video game. So this is a regressive story, which is again, the kind of story where a main character goes back in time to relive their life. I think in the story itself, um, it's described as an Iseki, um, reincarnation story. And I, I have issues with that, with that description because reincarnation definitely to me describes getting a new body, going to a new place. But that's, that's a small thing that just bugged me. And I, <laughs> I had to mention it because my brain won't let it go. Um, so I call this, re these are regressor stories where you're regressing in time and reliving your life. Um, but again, that that kind of um, story has some very interesting qualities to it in the fact that it, it makes the main character overpowered because of the knowledge that they have. And that's always an interesting way to, 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 to tell a story because you have a main character who can do, it, it, it starts off super weak usually, but because they have that foreknowledge, they can do some amazing things because they're they're using skills, they're using uh, their brains instead of just getting like necessarily an OP, you know, piece of equipment. And I always enjoy that kind of story where it's a very smart character. And this is not any different. The main character um, is has to avoid avoids the, the character creation traps in the game that are well known in the future, but when it's initially starting, aren't aren't well known it and lots of people have to remake their characters two weeks after they started because they messed up and they didn't see the the unspoken like rule conflicts or or, or like uh elemental conflicts necessarily um, and so she's using her her foreknowledge to create to kind of access these unknown or, or lesser known you know elemental abilities in this case the mystic mage and she she goes in secret quest lines, and she because she understands the rules so well, she's kind of she's not necessarily exploiting them. But she's definitely bending the rules or using them to her benefit where she sees them, or things that she may not get patched in the future, but aren't patched now. Um, and that's what the, what the story is. That's just it's a slice of life story. She's not super serious. No, she's not trying to save the world. She's not trying to get rich. Um, she's not saving people with her foreknowledge, which I have a little bit of issue with. It is just casual uh video game playing and she's using her turn knowledge of the game to to get better at something she devoted her her, her life to in the, in the future um why it's not super clear to be honest um but that doesn't make it on it that doesn't make it not entertaining it, it is in its own way um there are lots of there's still good action there's still good adventure there's some player versus player stuff here uh small group battles a lot of bunny killing i'm not sure why the author just decided to go on this murder horned bunny but you know murder spree i don't know if she has just a thing against rabbits um or or, or maybe 
you know, maybe they've offended her. Maybe they've eaten her, her garden. I don't know. But there's a lot of rabbit killing. Um, and you can see that there are some setups in the story for future relationships, um, bigger quests. But for now, in this first book, it's very much casual gaming, casual adventuring, XP grinding. Um, and just like, you know, a lot of bunny murdering. Um, on the game mechanic side of things, things are really crunchy. There's lots of game details, lots of numbers, large, lots of RPG mechanics that are explained. Um, and I like the way this this goes through because because the main character is foreknowledge of all the game mechanics. She's kind of doing, um, she's explaining some of the secrets and, and connections to the new players that she chooses to do so. And that's a, a wonderful way, in my opinion, of, of, of kind of expanding on the game mechanics without necessarily being an, a gigantic info dump. Because it's, it's spread out through conversations throughout the entire book. You get a really nice feel for, for what the game mechanics are. And, and, and seeing conflicts and seeing um, pitfalls with these game mechanics without necessarily having to like have the main character fail to discover them. Um, so it's, it's an interesting way to tell those game mechanics and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And again, anybody who likes crunchy, you know, number stuff, there's plenty of that in here for you. Um, the big draw of the story, the regressor aspect, um, again, gives the main character a confidence that she didn't have the first time through the world. And it was kind of interesting to see her compare her current self with her, her first round self, we'll call it. And, and the emotional issues she was dealing and still kind of deals with, um, but how she's become more confident over that five year period. And then it's sent back and reliving this life. She's, she, she's looking, she's kind of comparing her original decisions with her current decisions and, and, and making better decisions, but also just being a more confident woman who's like, I'm not going to take crap. I'm not going to deal with these idiots. I'm, they're going to, I'm absolutely peaking at these guys. Um, and it's, it's just kind of fun to see that, to, to, to feel that change in personality, even if, if you're not experiencing it firsthand, you, from, because she's told you your backstory, you can see the difference in, 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 in character, in, in, in growth in her character. Um, yet the character still has lost. She, she has social anxiety issues where she just, um, doesn't have a lot of social capital for, for group stuff necessarily. Um, and I, I can absolutely appreciate that. So that feels like a real, um, a real like emotion, uh, not emotional, but like social issue, uh, that a lot of readers will probably be able to connect with. Um, so I, I liked that as well. So lots of good stuff here. Um, I, I did personally have like issues with the regressor story, not, not being, I don't want to say used well, but not necessarily. And like the first thing I would do if I went back in time by beers and my life, okay, what are the stock options I can purchase to get rich? Uh, because being rich is like the best superpower in, in real life. Um, or, 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 you know, making up for my regrets. Like, who's that person that, that you know, I need to get a revenge on or some or, or saving people from natural disasters or something like that, right? Those would be my big things. You know, making up for regrets. That's part of the regressor kind of timeline thing. Playing the video game, I'm like, Okay, I, I I guess I mean I'm, maybe there's a point to it later. Um, maybe this will be like such a great you know game that it's going to change the economic model for the entire world. Um, potentially, I guess, uh, but that's not really made clear in the story. So, even though this is fun and interesting, the regressor aspect, in my opinion, isn't like used to its fullest. At least not in this first book. Maybe it's something that'll come out in 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 book number two or three, um, where there are more real life. Um, you know, consequences or, 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 or developments for her having gone back in time five years. Um, but in book number one, that doesn't really exist. She really just does play the game like 90% of the time. And, and 90% of the story takes place in this game. So um, overall, though, I had a good time with the story. It's well written. The adventures are entertaining. Um, if you need a serious plotline, if you need something like I got to save the world or, or I have to get revenge or I, or I have to save the game from a virtual AI or something, that doesn't exist here. So this may not be the story for you. This is really very slice of life. Um, and as long as you're okay with that, I think you might enjoy the different regressor aspect of the story, you know, it, as an interesting mix. Um, and I, it was entertaining where I wanted to see what thing the main character was going to do to take advantage of her full knowledge. So that's always entertaining. So it gets a score of 7.7 out of 10 for me. At Lotus Lake, Rise of the Mystic Mage with a score of 7.7 .7 out of 10. So really good.
Okay, next up we have Unbound, a dark fantasy liberty arcana unlocked book number one, written by Gregory Blackburn. It is 511 pages. It is $4.99. It's available on Kindle Limited. And here's the author's description. A game too good to be true, a golden opportunity, a nightmare he can't escape. If Arthur Mallory plays one more steaming pile of garbage disguised as a virtual role-playing game, he might hang up his gaming hat for good. When he discovers the new Deep Dive game, Worlds Unbound, he decides it might be worth a try. If it sucks, he'll just return it the next day and cancel the financing. The game is everything he could have wanted. Even without elves or dwarves or character creation, the magic system has him hooked. He's willing to overlook the mangled sleep schedule and crippling nightmares if it means feeling that the power running through his veins. It means feeling... Yes. But when an accident leaves his headset broken, he realizes he's, he might be cut off from the magic and the game for good. He's not going to let that happen. Okay, that, that, that introduction feels a little skewed and it doesn't quite fit in perfectly with what actually comes out of the book. Um, for the most part, it's accurate. Um, this game... First of all, it just didn't work for me. Um, parts of it were fine, but there were issues that it had, which I'll get into, um, that are that are that that just that made made it be entertaining for me. Um, there's an RPG consistency in the story um, that little bit readers are going to enjoy if you're into that. But for me, there are messy story elements. There's a magic structure um, that that have issues, um, and there are many times in the story where some of the game mechanics felt fudged. Um, and the, I mean, there's literally notifications that I'm going to describing um, that, that I'm like, oh, that that's that's an interesting choice that feels like it's, it exists to keep the story going and not necessarily, you know, lining up with an actual you know, mechanic. Um, and because of those reasons that left me not enjoying the novel overall, again, there are, again, are good elements, um, but overall it's like, nope, it doesn't work for me. Um, story wise, this is supposed to be a virtual reality game. Story where the where the first full immersion game comes out and the main character happens to get the last copy in his local store for seventy five thousand dollars. I'm not really sure what that element has to do with it. To be honest, it doesn't really come up again in the story. Um, maybe it'll be a thing in the future uh, for future novels. But for now, it's just, it's just oh, he has to pay seventy five thousand uh, dollars unless he returns it before the end of the trial period. So I'm like, okay, uh, the main character plays the game, goes on a series of adventures, not as himself or as a character it creates, but as an existing character in the virtual reality world. This means that the main character has that person's full memories downloaded into his mind and all the lore and all the world backstory that goes along with it, um, which I thought was an interesting choice. Um, I, I didn't like it personally, but I, I, I acknowledge that it's the author's right to do so. I just, I, for me, it became an info dump because... Anytime the main character needed to know something, he just kind of automatically knew it. He was like, oh, okay, that piece of lore, I know that. And he describes it to the reader, um, but it feels like unearned knowledge because it, it generally feels like the main character shouldn't know that, the character he inhibits shouldn't know that. Um, and so it really just feels like, oh, um, very often like, oh, you make a, a lore role and the DM describes something. And that's what it felt like a lot of times. Um but anyways, along the way, the main character suffers from several glitches, but cruises through several magic systems as he adventures in levels. Okay, so that's kind of the gist of the story. Um, on its own, again, not a terrible story, but again, several aspects ruined would have been a very good exploration of either the RPG stuff or the story world. Um, the most coloring aspect that I really didn't enjoy was the virtual reality aspect, oddly enough. It's not necessarily a bad setup on its own, but I don't think it's used well here. And I don't think it actually fits with the actual storytelling that happens. Um, worse, I think it kind of detracts from what could have been just a, a better fantasy RPG story. The virtuality system, which on its face, again, doesn't really make sense. Um, felt like it was there to justify why there are stats, why there are classes, why there are notifications, and add a weird side element of the main character being controlled in, in real life and being hurt by the game because of the memory downloads. Um, but it's not an aspect of the story that really um, was really developed at all. Like the, that, that part of the story kind of took up like 10%, maybe 15 at the max, where the main characters in the world world dealing with the consequences of any of that stuff. Um, and it just felt like it's weird tangent of like, it's not really developed and it doesn't really go anywhere. I'm not really sure why it exists. 
And again, because it did exist, though, it did detract for what could have been, again, just a, a, a much better told, just fantasy RPG story. Why the main character has to, like, jump into this main character, this, 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 this character in the world, instead of just having the story about that character. It, it just, it, it is what it is. Um, it just didn't work for, for me. And, like, I kept thinking, like, this is distracting. Um, and I'll get on the whole because the main character again, took the role of that resident in this fantasy world, um, again, it just would have been to hold without the virtual reality aspect. Uh, it would have let the main character learn about the world in a more natural way, through investigations, through conversations, instead of the game mechanics and the world are just kind of automatically being known by the main character without any work whatsoever. Um, another aspect of the story that kind of ruined what it could have been a good story was the messy exploration of magic and the fudge roles made in the story. Now, initially, I was kind of pleased with the mix of class skills and the kind of min-maxing aspect of, of what the main character um, chooses to do once he's uh, once his, once the character and he habits um, get access to the system. Um, there's an unusual magic system that made me think the story is going to be like a thinking man's magic character. Instead, uh, as the story progressed, it became obvious that the main character kind of had this two-year-old's attention span for sticking to one kind of magic. He essentially goes from like, oh, this is a cool magic system. I'm going to use this a lot. And it's like, oh, look, I can cl- I can split off into this other magic system. And again, and again, it happens like four, I want to say four or five times in the story where he gets a new, new branch of magic and he just kind of swivels into that. Um, and it, to me, it was such a wasted opportunity because each one of those individually is kind of cool. They really are. But because there's not a lot of time spent with them, you kind of get to see them in a couple of fights and then there's a switch and there's no real depth to each one of those. And so each one kind of feels very um, undeveloped. It's like there's sur- those potentially cool things happening there, but you never really get to see that because the main character is switching or advancing his his magic in, in a way that that kind of negates them. And 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 to me, it, it's just kind of a wasted opportunity because I would have really have loved to see them all developed. Maybe one per book instead of four or five per book. Um, that's me. Um, the story, while in cool in some places, is again mostly slice of life following. Um, a, a kind of a messy s- pattern of the main character leaping from quest line to quest line, which not much follow through, which made the story feel a little bit um, frenetic and, and messy. Um, and, and, and for me, this is one of the things that really just bugged me. Um, the game mechanics, they felt fudged. And that, that, that to me, I understand why, why authors do it. Um, you don't want to kill from your character because you have a bad role necessarily. Um, but they're just like, they're, they're shown in the story where it's like, uh, there's, there's a mechanic in the story where the main character makes roles for other knowledge checks or skill checks. Um, and, and, and I generally like the, that, that showing of those skill checks, um, uh, cause it makes it feel like, oh, like the author's really rolling these, these dice to see if the character to see it fails. And sometimes the main character fails, the author leaves it alone or makes, even makes a joke, but I'm perfectly happy with what bothered me was when it says, oh, the character failed this role, but he, he really succeeded because of outside circumstances or tier differences. And I'm like, so, so he failed the role, but he really succeeded. So the story can continue or he can get this information he needs. Um, and I'm like, it, 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 it happened a lot. And like that really bugged me because it made the game elements feel less important. And I can understand that happening in like a, a tabletop game setting where, you know, the dungeon master doesn't want to kill off like wipe it or the entire group or they need a piece of lore to, you know, finish the quest or something. He might, you know, fudge roll, but he doesn't usually tell them. He doesn't usually say, oh, you failed that role, but because it's really important, I'm going to just magically save you. You know, he just, he just says, like, and so it just felt weird to me to see the failure, but also say, oh, no, no we're basically just making this up and saying it's success for whatever reason. Um, and, and so that that bugged me. Um, a, a, a super small gripe, which is not going to like bother most people, I think, is how the game mechanics, how the notifications were, were, were written in the story. Uh, they were underlined. Uh, and, and this meant that there were sometimes just like paragraphs of text in the story that was, that was underlined entirely 
And my brain did not like that at all. Like I really would have preferred a different formatting choice. And, and this is just going to sound like bugs my brain. I would have preferred rather than just, again, multiple paragraphs sometimes of, of just entirely underlying text, um, italics, it all in italics to show the game notifications or brackets or, or, or just a different uh, font text to, to show that these are game notifications that, that would have bothered my brain a lot less. Um, but mind you, this is just formatting choices. Not a huge deal. It doesn't really take up any points, but my brain, it bugged me and, and it might bother other people, which is the only reason I'm mentioning it. Um, so on the game mechanic thing, side of things, this story was, was pretty good. Um, the author goes out of his way to make things consistent, show lots of numbers on a fairly regular basis. There was lots of standard literary stuff, classes, stats, item descriptions, quest notifications. Um, again, I generally liked the elements of showing role checks for, for knowledge checks, spell successes, magical theory checks. I, I, you know, in general, I enjoy seeing those roles because it makes it feel like, oh, this is actually, there, there's a chance that the character can fail. And when he fails, spectacularly, there can be like weird consequences that change the course of the story. However, as I mentioned before, many of those roles felt fudged. So that wasn't great. Um, let's see. Um, some of the magic stuff was really cool. Um, but again, having so many transitions felt like they weren't really in depth. So there you go. Overall, while some of the story arcs in the novel are generally entertaining, um, there were just too many elements that made the story less enjoyable for me. It really felt like the novel was based on a custom tabletop game where the DM was kept trying to keep the players coming back after each session by switching storylines, opening up unique magic systems, and fudging roles so that there were a few failures, which didn't work for me as a reader, unfortunately. Um, so for me, it doesn't get to, it gets a score of 6 out of 10, which isn't a bad review score. It's just this doesn't work for me. If the issues I mentioned aren't the type of things that bother you, you probably enjoy this. Uh, and, the, and the novel it really has a good number of uh, good positive review scores. It's just that I can't be one of them because of the issues I mentioned. Um, so for me, this is Unbound, a dark fantasy of uh, with a score of 6 out of 10, which means that it just doesn't work for me. Okay, next up is Dungeon Walkers by Daniel Schoenhofen. This is a new series from the author. Um, it is 481 pages, $4.99. It's available on Kindle Limited, and here's the author's description. Dungeon walkers brave the depths of the dungeon for personal gain. Clearing the dungeon means dungeon points to purchase gear with, and more importantly, perks. Perks are the main reason walkers put their lives on the line. Every time a dungeon is cleared for the first time, a walker gets a choice of three perks that, would, that could change their lives. Not every walker makes it out alive. When someone dies in the dungeon, their soul is fragmented into four shards, which can be purchased for dungeon points. Collecting all four shards and taking, and taking them to a temple of the goddess means the dead can live again. There is a subsect of walkers that makes it their goal to bring the dead back from dungeons. They're called the Rescue Squad. Stern is intent on joining the ranks of the Rescue Squad. Finally done with his six months at the academy, he's about to take, make his first run through a dungeon. It will not be easy. He doesn't have a crew or a team to run with. Stern is an irregular, someone born with unusual perks and unfortunately looking like the Blighted. Being seen as blinded has made Stern's life hell, but he keeps pushing on, intent on making his goal real. Despite his hardships, he's been blessed with the unusual perk of a lifelong friend, Polly. Polly is a polydactyl, polydactical Maine Coon, who is protective of her friend and eager to help him reach his goal. With his friend beside him, Stern is ready to start his adventure. Man, that's a lot. That's a long novel description. Um, full of social, I received advanced copy for review. I purchased copy when it became available. Okay, this is this is an easy review. Um, I generally just about anything uh, Dana Shino has written, I really enjoyed. This is no different. Um, this is a very easy read. The dialogue and the world building are done so well. It's effortless to get lost in the dungeon knife story, and the pages fly by. Within the first five percent of the story, I, I I like the main character. I'm aware of his perceived weakness. And there's enough world building done through conversation that I understand why the main character is going through these dungeons. And it's just the smooth writing just draws you in and you just get on with the adventure. Um, and it, it, it's, it's mostly just like a really entertaining story of, of adventure, of dungeon diving, character development, uh, a little bit of world building here and there. Um, and, a, you know, some good RPG progression. 
Um, most of the story is, is just, just that. It's just slice of life, dungeon diving with some occasional backstory, um, his companion, and some world building. Dialogue and action are good. And there's enough conflict between him and the other character and some other characters in the story to make even the non-dungeon sections interesting. Now, the last 25% is where I kind of have an issue and I lost a little bit of enjoyment. The last 25% is almost entirely relationship building leading predictably to a polyamorous relationship. That's, it's, it's definitely a, a thing with the author's writing. Um, that's the kind of romantic relations that generally develop. And that's perfectly cool. It's just that I saw it happening before it happened. And maybe that's because I've read so much of the author's work where I'm like, hmm, there's a slight romance here. Bet you it's going to be go poly. And I was right. It's like, okay. Uh, and, 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 and even in that case, I don't generally like, I get, romance stuff isn't really my thing in the stuff I read. Um, and I don't usually, usually mind it. And I, in this case, I don't mind either. It's just that it all kind of happened in one gigantic chunk. And the last 24 minutes is almost entirely that. This is, there's not a lot of adventuring there. There's a little bit of training, but it's mostly that advancement of that relationship. Um, and I think I've read <laughs> so much of the author's work where I'm like, I bet you I can predict what kind of relationship it's going to be like, what this character has is broken and they're going to need like a lot of like encouragement and like love and trust and, and goodwill to, to get them into the, the mode to, to be in that poly relationship. And this other one's going to be uh, more of a, 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 an aggressor type and, and, and it all played out exactly like I thought it was. I was like, okay, it's, and again, it's not bad writing. There's no sex in this one, which is kind of a, a, a different take for the author and a lot of his works. There, I mean, there, there's adult relationships and there is inferred sex, but it's all paid back. So there's no like hardcore scenes or anything. Um, but it was all like, it, it, it felt a little predictable to me. And that might just because I've read so much of his, the author's stuff was like, huh, I, I kind of guess where this is going. And I was correct. And so it wasn't, it was like, okay, you know, nothing really particularly negative um, for, for me. It's just like, it's like, I felt it was predictable. And, and and so that was kind of learning. I really would have preferred just seeing their relation develop um, over the course of the entire novel instead of just like in one big chunk. But that's just me. Um, so just it kind of lowered my enjoyment a little bit because of that particular, um, you know, story choice. Other people don't care about it. They're going to have a really good time with it. They're, if it, you know, so that, that is just me. I still had a good time with the story. I had, I liked the story. It's just that part of it is like, oh, okay, that, Dropped my enjoyment a little bit. Um, on the game mechanic side of things, I actually liked it. It has a really um, unique design element of the power progression system and the dungeon system and also the ability to kill off a character but also have them come back. I really liked that storytelling potential where a, a character can die and they can still have a future existence in the story. This is not necessarily, which includes potentially villains as well. Um, where villains can die inside the dungeon uh, or antagonists and, and still make a comeback somewhere where they can get the main character again later in the future. Um, so good stuff all around there. Um, the dungeon stuff is kind of talked about in the novel description, so I won't go into it too much. But again, it's not necessarily levels. It really is just do a dungeon, get a perk that advances your character, um, and or, or spend dungeon points on, on gear, or you can buy them in real life. Which which kind of ends up being the main character's superpower. Like the, his best superpower, honestly, is like he's rich, so he can buy a bunch of cool stuff. Um, and I think that's really his best superpower, in my opinion. Um, but there are still other RPG aspects of like uh, getting special abilities and having those become more powerful by investing more more perks as you clear more dungeons. Um, but and the dungeon I mean is is, is excellent and that it's good action, good good variety of monsters, um, good um, variety of of, of a clear. Um, um, strategies. So nice, nice stuff there. Um, overall, I had a good time with the story. It was entertaining, and again, even though I thought it was predictable towards the end, um, readers who like a casual slice of life adventure story will like this. Um, and people who who like the author's other works, who have read them, are going to find some nice, nice Easter eggs in here that I'm not going to spoil. But I like a lot of people who, when they get to the towards the end, like. Oh my gosh, I see what he's doing, and they're super happy about it. Um, so it gets to run out a little bit. For me, it gets a score of 7.3 out of 10. Had a good time with it. Uh, drops a little bit because of the issues I mentioned, but still, an entertaining story. That's Dungeon Walkers, book number one, with a score of 7.3 out of 10. 
Okay, next up is going to be a review for the online webcomic Beast Genius. This is a translated um, story, so nobody really has the English rights to it. Um, here's the uh, webcomic description. The protagonist gets hit by lightning while playing a game beta and gains a special ability to transform into his handsome character from the game in real life. Follow his adventures living as both himself and the game's alter ego. Perfect, short, sweet novel description or uh, webcomic description that really hits the highlights. Um, as of this recording, there are 30 translated novel, just translated chapters rather. Um, it is free. Uh, link in the show notes. There is no English license. Once there is an English license, we'll switch out the, show, uh, the, the link to the official one. Uh, but for now, this is a slice of life high school literary manga, manga, uh, online manga, where the main character is a teen in high school who gets an RPG interface. He has the class powers of the game character he was playing in real life, a healer, and looks just like his handsome character from the game while his powers are activated. The story follows him as he tries to help his hospitalized mom adjust to his new appearance and the corresponding changes to how his, the world treats him and uses his powers to complete quests and generally help people when he can. It's a very casual, slice life story where the main character uh, is good looking now. Uh, and it's, and that is almost as big of a superpower as his ability to heal, do RPG quests, or, or getting gain XP. Um, and it's really, it's just like you're following him around as he goes through these situations where he's meeting people he should know already, um, but they don't recognize him where he goes back to high school. Um, and they just think he had a great growth spurt. <laughs> um, and it's just kind of a fun... Um, casual story where there's occasional leveling and quests and healing, and he kind of very slowly explores those aspects. But there's enough of it to to still be a little bit. Deep. And I enjoy it. It's, um, the only downside is that the translations only come out every month or two weeks sometimes, and so it's a it's a it's a slower branch. So I've waited to had at least thirty chapters for you guys to enjoy. Um, but it's it's entertaining. I'm actually going to show you the artwork. Um, the so you can see what it looks like here artwork is nice and crisp clean lines and you can see the two differences between real life nerdy short kid and his game character which we eventually come to look like once he you know gets a uh, rpg interface and his 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 abilities because of lightning um and that's not really spoiled in the novel description so um there it is there's the artwork i enjoyed the story it gets a score seven point what did i give it seven point four to ten loses a little bit just because they're, it's slow release schedule, um, and I like reading things, you know, a little bit faster than that. But still, enjoyable series. Again, real casual, easy read. Have a good time with us. So that's Face Genius with the score seven point four out of ten. Um, and I think this, there's a novel version of it. I'm just not in the novel, so I really do enjoy the web comic stuff much much more. Okay, there we go. That's it for the end of the show. Thanks a lot for listening, for watching. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon, on our website at littlebitchpodcast.com, Spotify, Audible. So many places you can listen to the podcast or watch our videos. Um, remember, if you like the show, please like, share it. Um, share it with your friends. Share it with your neighbors. Share it online um, so that other people can enjoy the genre and the books that you enjoy um, and can see some of the cool things that's happening in our genre. It's always a fun thing to do. Um, and if you enjoy the podcast and want to help support us, you can find out all the ways to do so at lit, litrpgpodcast.com. But it's where we can hang out again, folks. Remember to go read some Lit RPG. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>